Hello. Welcome again. Let me just adjust the camera a little bit. There we go. Welcome again to uh, another video in the Bhagavad Gita series. And today we begin chapter 3. Chapter 3 is about what I call the yoga of action, that is to say karma yoga. And um, it begins, picking up from where we left off, we're going to look today at verses 1 and 2. Arjuna said, If you think that awareness is better than actions born of desire, Krishna, why are you trying to cause me to commit such horrid acts? Your words are clear, yet they confuse me. So please tell me now, directly, what must I do that will benefit me? So, this is the start of, of chapter 3. In chapter 2, you'll recall, Krishna had spent, well, 72 verses trying to um, explain kind of the nature of enlightenment to Arjuna. And in chapter 3 at the start, we get that Ar Arjuna did not pick up the point, right? He said that your words are clear, but I'm still confused, right? And the reason is because it, it, he heard what was being said, but he didn't get it on the inside, right? And this is a problem that's quite common in spiritual teaching, right? You'll hear something, you might understand, like, the clarity of the message of it, right? Um, you might get, well, you know, you can't just repeat the same mistakes, right? That's a, a statement, right? You can't just repeat the same mistakes. And you'll go, yeah, that's right. You can't just repeat the same mistakes. But you'll keep repeating the same mistakes. And that's because you understood it intellectually, but you did not understand it internally, right? And Krishna goes on, or Arjuna, sorry, goes on in verse 2 to ask exactly the wrong question. He said, what must I do that will benefit me? Right? He's still talking entirely from that self-referential perspective. He's looking at it from his concept of himself at the center of everything that is around him, right? which is the, a typical unenlightened human behavior. Right? Um, this is not Self-referential doesn't exactly mean self-centered or selfish or something like that. Um, there are people who are self-centered. There are people who are selfish. Um, but everybody is in some degree self-referential, right? Self-referential just means that you're looking at things from the picture of your own place, right? And, and you're not... Um, expanding your awareness to the larger perspective because there's something very interesting that happens when you genuinely expand your awareness enough you get to the point where you're not in the middle and that's very very important because a lot of people start in work like meditation and qigong or other practices right with this idea that they're in the middle. And if you're in the middle, then what happens to you is the most important thing, right? And what you do, what will benefit me, is the most important thing, right? Um, Arjuna's actions, it, 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 to recap from before in the, in the previous parts of the, of the book, um, he was supposed to be one of the commanders in this apocalyptic battle, a battle that would destroy the civilization he was in, um, but that would effectively uh, defeat a danger that would plunge humanity into a, an even worse dark age, right? which was in the form of, of his opponents. Um, and at the last moment, the problem was this was a civil war. He looked at the other side of the battlefield, he saw all his friends were there, you know, his, his cousins were all the main enemies that he was fighting. Everybody he knew was at this battle, and he knew that almost everybody was going to come out of it dead. And he realized that one way or the other, um, nobody was going to win this battle in any real sense. You know, there was going to be the one side that was going to lose less, you could say, right? And that, that 
um, it was either nothing will be saved or a little bit of something will be saved, and that was it. But that wasn't really what Arjuna had had in mind. Arjuna came into this battle with this vision that, you know, he got kind of like, you know, when a person first goes to war and you have this, this kind of glorious vision in your head. Now, he was an experienced warrior, but he'd never been to something like this, right? To, according to the legends, there were millions of people fighting. That's probably exaggerated, but, but there were supposedly millions of people fighting in the, the Battle of Kurukshetra, right? And it meant that literally everything was going to be devastated. This was an apocalyptic war from the context of this time. Um, and that's not what he wanted. Arjuna wanted a battle that would be decisive, that would be quick, that would end um, the conflict permanently and then rule over a peaceful kingdom and have prosperity and live in his palace and everything would be nice and things would be would be good again, right? And, and he realized that at, at the moment of the battle that there was that not, that was not going to happen right that the, that this was the end of the age right this was the beginning of the Kali Yuga the dark age right and and he saw that the things he was fighting for if the question was what is what's in it for me he wasn't going to get them right um, now part of this is that you could you can talk about kind of fighting for nobler causes or things like that, right? But that's not really the, what, what Krishna is trying to emphasize here. Krishna is trying to say that there's this much bigger perspective. It's not about fighting for king and country, or it's not about fighting for, um, you know, some kind of a political ideology or something like that. This is about doing what is your true will to do, what is the essence of your nature, fulfilling your nature. And that's what Krishna is trying to emphasize on him. Uh, Krishna was, was trying to explain to Arjuna that if he doesn't fight here, then he betrays his, his true will, his actual nature, which is not, not, not quite, you know, some people think that this means like, oh, what I was always, I was always meant to be a chiropractor or something like that, right? And that, that I'm, I'm, you know, I was destined by God or by white light or by spirit or by whatever to, to become a chiropractor or a, or a rodeo clown or whatever, right? And that's, that's not really how it works. But what true will means is that there's a fundamental individuality to you, right? In, in the I Ching, it's called the superior individual. There's, a, there's a, an essence um, that is truth within you, and you have to live the truth of that essence, right? And that means that true will is not just a noun, it's not a thing you get, right? It's also a thing you do, it's a verb. And it's something that at first you're not aware of it. You know, the typical person, the person that is in the, in the level of personality rather than individuality, doesn't get what their true will is until you begin to do evaluation of yourself, and to do that, you have to first loosen the ties, the bonds of the persona, right, of what you sometimes call the ego in, in Buddhism, right, um, to see where what that essential nature is. That, and that essential nature isn't really you, you know, it's the end of the division between you and reality. So then, when you realize that then there's nothing that you that you are meant to do other than that thing, right? Other than what it is that you're supposed to be doing at any given time. And it's not because it's destiny, it's not something that's written in the stars or that's inevitable or something like that, but it's what will actually bring you into union with what is real. So now Krishna is going to go on, in, as you'll see in the next videos, to talk about this question of action, right? Why are some actions um, natural and others not? And what, how can one actually fulfill their individuality? And, and why is it that enlightenment requires action at all? So stay tuned for that next time. Take care.